On the evening of April 7, 1990, 25-year-old Nancy Langert looked at the cardboard boxes stacked up in the living room of her home in Winnetka, Illinois, trying to figure out what else she still had to pack. She and her husband Richard were moving at the end of the month, and Nancy could not wait. She was almost three months pregnant, and the new house had a lot more space, including a room for the baby's nursery. But as Nancy scanned the room, she realized there really wasn't much left for her to do. Other than the boxes, the only things in the room were a TV, a stereo, a card table, and some folding chairs. The truth was that even though she and Richard had been staying in this small townhouse for months that was owned actually by her parents, they had never actually really settled in. It always felt like it was a temporary place to sort their finances out, after Richard had racked up some serious gambling debt. As soon as the thought of Richard's gambling crossed her mind, Nancy shook her head and then called for her little dog, Pepsi. She heard his nails clicking across the floor, and she picked him up and scratched under his chin, trying to take her mind off of Richard's gambling and their money issues. But it was no use. It was all she could think about. Both Nancy and Richard had good jobs working at a growing coffee company, but Richard had always liked to bet on sports. And at some point, he had started spending more than he earned and began also borrowing money from friends to keep up with his gambling. It had all come to a head months earlier when Nancy and Richard fell behind on bills and had to move into this townhouse owned by Nancy's parents. And then Nancy's mother had to create a budget for them and put them on a weekly allowance, which was very embarrassing for both of them. But recently, things had gotten a lot better. They'd paid down their debt, built up their savings again, and now they were about to move out of this temporary home. In fact, at this very moment, Nancy even had $500 in cash in her purse to deposit into her bank account. Nancy gave Pepsi a kiss and put him down on the floor, and she reminded herself to stay positive. Richard was trying hard to curb his spending, and other than his gambling issue, he really was a great husband. And Richard and Nancy had both wanted a baby for so long, and now it was finally happening, and she knew Richard was going to be an amazing father. Feeling better, Nancy sat down on a folding chair and flipped on the TV. At around 6.30 p.m., the phone rang. It was Richard, telling Nancy he was leaving work, and he'd be home to pick her up in just a few minutes. They were celebrating Nancy's father's 60th birthday that night. They had an 8 p.m. dinner reservation, but they were picking up Nancy's parents and sister at her sister's place first. Nancy turned off the TV, picked up Pepsi, and took him upstairs to the bedroom so he wouldn't chew up any of the cardboard boxes while they were gone. After putting him inside, she shut the door gently, walked back downstairs, threw on a coat, and walked outside to Richard's car, shivering in the early spring chill. A few minutes later, Nancy's sister, Jean, opened the door to her apartment with a huge smile on her face. She led Nancy and Richard inside, and then she handed Nancy two beautifully wrapped presents that she'd brought back from a recent trip to Ireland. Nancy opened up the first gift and found a gorgeous Irish wool sweater inside. But the other present made Nancy feel like she might cry from happiness. It was a little onesie and booties for a newborn baby. Nancy thanked Jean repeatedly and gave her a big hug. She was so happy. At around 8 p.m., the group got to the restaurant, and Nancy was happily surprised to see that none of her parents' friends were meeting them there. The celebration would now just be with family. It wasn't that Nancy didn't like her parents' friends, though. Some of them had been around for so long that they actually felt like her own family, like her dad's work friend, Nick Biro, and his wife, Joan, who she had totally expected to be there. But then there was this guy, Victor, who was one of her father's closest friends, but he was also rumored to be in the mob. Nancy didn't mind Victor, but Richard could not stand him, so his absence from the party was a relief. As the food started to arrive to their table, Nancy suddenly didn't feel well. Her pregnancy was giving her really bad nausea, and the smell of pasta and steak just set it off. But she didn't want to ruin the night for everyone, so she tried to hide the fact that she really just wanted to go throw up. However, she could see her mom looking over at her with a raised eyebrow from across the table, and Nancy forced a smile back. She knew she was not convincing her mother that she was doing okay, but her mother just went back to her lasagna without saying anything in fear she might embarrass her daughter. After dinner, Nancy and the rest of her family all piled back into Richard's car so he could drive everybody home. He dropped Nancy's sister Jean off first, and when she got out, Jean gave Nancy a big hug and told her she would see her tomorrow at church. Then Richard dropped off Nancy's parents. However, Nancy's mother paused before getting out of the car. She said she noticed at dinner that Nancy was feeling sick and asked if maybe Nancy and Richard wanted to spend the night there, at her house. For a second, Nancy did consider it. I mean, having your parents around if you're feeling sick is kind of like what everybody wants. But Richard was supposed to dog sit for a neighbor, and she wanted to sleep in her own bed, cuddled up with Pepsi. So she ultimately said, you know, no thank you. 
My parents then said goodnight, and then they walked into their house. On the drive back home, Richard and Nancy planned out the rest of their evening. Richard would walk the neighbor's dog, and then actually sleep over at the neighbor's house to keep the dog company. But first, Nancy and Richard would take their dog, Pepsi, for a walk together. They pulled up to their townhouse, and Richard walked around the car, opened up Nancy's door, and helped her outside. They smiled at each other, and he asked her how she was feeling, and Nancy said she still felt nauseous, but she was too happy about everything to let it bother her. Richard gave Nancy's shoulder a quick squeeze, and then they walked inside together. At 7 a.m. the next morning, Nancy's mother called her daughter to see if she was feeling any better. But Nancy didn't pick up, so her mom figured she must be sleeping in and hung up without leaving a message. She knew she would just see her daughter later at church anyway. However, when Nancy's mother got to church that day and took her seat in their regular pew, the bench beside her stayed empty for the entire service. Nancy's mom worried the entire time, so as soon as she got back home, she called her daughter again. And when Nancy still didn't answer, Nancy's father said he was going over to the townhouse to make sure everything was okay. Nancy's dad got to the townhouse just a few minutes later. He figured Nancy was just sick and sleeping, so he wasn't actually all that worried. He rang the bell, but nobody answered, so he took out his own key, unlocked the door, and stepped inside. The place felt oddly quiet, and no one responded when he called out. Then, Nancy's dad saw his daughter's purse lying on the floor, surrounded by cash and credit cards, and so now he was worried. Suddenly, he heard a noise upstairs. It sounded like scratching on a door. So he ran out of the room, took the steps up two at a time, and then headed down the second floor hallway to Nancy's bedroom, where the scratching sound was coming from. There, he opened up the door, and the little dog Pepsi came running out, and the stench of urine immediately hit Nancy's dad. Now he was really starting to panic. He knew his daughter would never lock her precious dog in a room long enough for the dog to have to urinate all over the ground. He turned and ran back downstairs, now screaming his daughter's name, but still he didn't get an answer. He knew there was only one place he hadn't checked yet, the basement. Nancy's father ran to the top of the basement stairs. The basement light was on, but all he could see when he looked downstairs were shadowy shapes below, which he assumed must be their moving boxes. But as he slowly walked down the stairs and the shapes came into view, he gasped. They weren't boxes. They were the bodies of his pregnant daughter and his son-in-law. They were both covered in blood. Nancy was still wearing her clothes from the night before, and her eyes were wide open. For a moment, Nancy's father simply froze, unable to process what he was seeing. Then he leapt down the remaining stairs to his daughter's side and grabbed her hand, but it was freezing cold. He sprinted back up the stairs, and he dialed 911. When Etka Police Sergeant Gene Calvatis woke up to the sound of his wife's voice calling him from the other room, he blinked at his clock, which read 6.40 p.m. He'd worked overnight and hadn't gotten to bed until about midday, and now his wife was saying he had yet another phone call from headquarters. All Sergeant Calvatis wanted was just to go back to sleep, but he forced himself to get up and go to the phone because this was his job. And as soon as he heard his lieutenant's voice in the phone, Calvatis snapped wide awake. The lieutenant said there had been a double homicide, and Calvatus needed to get to the scene right now. A few minutes later, Sergeant Calvatus parked his car outside of Nancy and Richard's townhouse. Calvatus had seen plenty of violent deaths in his life. Before he became a police officer, he had served in Vietnam, and he had watched other young men in his unit grow hardened to bloodshed and violence, but Calvatus really never got used to it. In fact, Calvatus could see the face of every dead person he'd ever seen as clearly as if they were still right in front of him. And now, he braced himself for the faces he was about to see in that basement. Sergeant Calvatus stepped out of his car, and he saw several officers speaking to Nancy's father outside the house. Calvatus quickly introduced himself, and then headed inside, where a forensics team was already combing through the townhouse. One of the forensics officers came over to Calvatus. He said the double homicide had taken place in the basement. But before Calvatus went downstairs, he wanted to show the detective three pieces of evidence they'd found on the first floor. The forensics officer pointed to the ground just a few feet away, and Calvatus noticed Nancy's purse lying there with $500 in cash and several credit cards lying next to it. Calvatus quickly noticed there was still a TV and a high-end stereo in the room, so it seemed unlikely that what they were dealing with here was a robbery gone bad. Then the forensics officer led Calvatus towards a door that opened onto a small back patio. Calvatus saw a perfectly cut square piece of glass, which had been removed from the door and placed on the floor inside. 
and the forensics officer pointed out something interesting. The door was still locked. So whoever cut the glass did not reach through the hole and unlock the door, which would have been easy. Instead, they literally climbed through the small hole in the door, which would have taken far more time and effort. Finally, the forensics officer took Calvatus over to a small card table that was next to a moving box. The officer said it looked like someone had rifled through the box and put a single item from it on the table. Calvatus leaned in, and a look of surprise came across his face. The item on the table was Nancy and Richard's marriage license. But the forensics officer said he didn't know yet if the person who broke in had put the license there or if maybe it just happened to be there already. Calvatus thanked the officer, and then after taking a deep breath, he headed to the basement, hoping things would start to get a bit clearer down there. Calvatus walked down the steps slowly, and as the scene came into view, he couldn't help but wince. Richard had been handcuffed and shot in the back of the head. It looked like he had probably died instantly. Nancy, though, was not handcuffed, and her death had clearly been slow. She was shot twice in her side and in her abdomen, and there was blood smeared all around her body, like she had crawled or rolled in the blood after being wounded, and her eyes were still open, frozen in her final moment. Calvatus also saw an axe on the floor between Richard and Nancy, and he wondered how that figured into the crime if the killer had a gun. Had the couple tried to fight back with it? He didn't know. Then something else caught Sergeant Calvatus's attention. On a moving box between the bodies, a small heart and the letter U were scrawled in blood. Calvatus crouched down and saw blood on one of Nancy's fingertips, so he wondered if she had left this message, or if the killer had staged it to look that way. Regardless of the answer, Calvatus realized whoever killed Nancy and Richard had not acted in the heat of the moment. The handcuffs and the execution-style shooting of Richard proved that. And that execution-style shooting made Calvatus wonder if the murders had been carried out by a professional hitman. The cut glass in the patio door could also support that theory because it suggested a very high level of planning. But Calvatus stood there and just shook his head, like he was arguing with himself. Removing the glass in the door seemed like something a professional would do, but then why would the professional killer squeeze through the small hole in the door instead of just reaching in and unlocking the door? Also, Richard's murder seemed like a cold-blooded, very efficient assassination, whereas Nancy's murder seemed sloppy. She clearly lived long enough to roll or crawl through the blood on the floor, and she might have lived long enough to even write that message on the moving box. So in a way, Calvatus felt like he was almost looking at two different crime scenes at once, one crime scene for Richard and one crime scene for Nancy. Calvatus suddenly felt a tap on his shoulder. It was one of the officers who'd been talking to Nancy's dad. The officer told Calvatus he had very important information. Nancy had been pregnant. Calvatus' heart sank. He knew the look on Nancy's face would stay with him for a very long time. Later that day, as officers met with Nancy and Richard's neighbors, the chief of police decided to form a task force to investigate the double murder. He said he would ask for help from detectives from surrounding suburbs, but he wanted Sergeant Calvatus to lead the team. Calvatus knew this was going to be the biggest challenge of his career. A double homicide of a young couple that was potentially carried out by a professional hitman was a whole different level of crime than he'd ever seen in Winnetka. The next day, Sergeant Calvatus knocked on the door of Nancy's parents' house. Nancy's dad opened the door, and Calvatus could tell from his puffy eyes that he'd been crying. As gently as he could, Calvatus asked the father if he could get Nancy and Richard's wedding albums and address books, or anything that could help him identify all of their friends and acquaintances. Nancy's father just nodded, looking shell-shocked, and invited the sergeant to come inside while he looked. Calvatus stepped inside and then sat down on the couch, and Nancy's mother came in. She also had a vacant stare on her face, almost like she literally couldn't process what had happened. Still, almost on autopilot, she politely offered him some coffee, which Calvatus said no thank you to. Then, Calvatus told her that he was the one leading this investigation, and he really needed her to think as hard as she could about all the people in her daughter's life. Did she know anyone who might want to hurt Nancy or Richard? But Nancy's mother shook her head and said no. And as Nancy's father came in with the things the sergeant had asked for, he also said the same thing. Nancy and Richard were wonderful people with a big supportive group of friends. The idea that either of them had enemies seemed kind of ridiculous. On Tuesday, April 10th, so three days after the murders, Nancy and Richard's bosses at the coffee company offered a $10,000 reward for information in the case and also Nancy's parents matched it. And so tips about Nancy and Richard began to pour in. Phones at police headquarters rang constantly, and before long, the task force was totally inundated. 
And as Sergeant Calvetis sifted through all this new information they were getting, a new and much more complicated picture of the murdered couple began to emerge. A few tipsters alerted the sergeant to Richard's gambling debts and the fact that he very likely owed people money because of his gambling problem. This was a major red flag to Calvetis, but the debts themselves actually seemed way too small to be worth killing two people over. However, the tips about Nancy were more promising. Apparently, she had had an affair for more than a year, and her former lover had left town for Georgia just two days after the murders. This, combined with the marriage contract left on the table at the crime scene, made Calvatus wonder if the killings were retaliation from Nancy's ex-lover for breaking the affair off. Calvatus sent detectives down to Georgia to speak with Nancy's former lover, but the man said the affair was far more emotional than physical. Nancy mostly just wanted someone to talk to because Richard was working two jobs and she was just kind of lonely. But when Richard got his full-time job at the coffee company, the couple had totally reconciled and they got back to normal. And so this ex-lover said at that point, he also had been ready to move on. And so even though the move to Georgia came so close to the murders, it had actually been planned out for weeks. Calvatus wasn't quite prepared to rule this man out quite yet, but he was already finding this case very frustrating. Everything from the conflicting evidence at the crime scene where, you know, one murder is well-planned and the other seems sloppy and, you know, the glass, why did you climb through and not unlock it by reaching through, to the contradictory stories about the victims seemed to pull him in very different directions. Meanwhile, rumors of hitmen and criminal syndicates began flying all over town. There was a bike path that ran behind Nancy and Richard's house leading basically all the way to Chicago and residents became convinced that a Chicago mobster must have been the killer and they must have used that path to travel in and out sight unseen. Calvatus did not necessarily buy that, but he got a tip that a close friend of Nancy's father, a man named Victor, supposedly had ties to the mafia. So Calvatus began digging. However, he struggled to find anything useful. At least on the surface, Victor looked like an upstanding businessman. So Calvatus was not any closer to nailing down a primary suspect. Four days after the murders, a massive crowd of 800 people from the area gathered for Nancy and Richard's funeral. I mean, the community really came out in force, to the point where random local groups like the high school's Peace Alliance Club and the track team were waiting in these long lines after the service just to offer their condolences to Nancy and Richard's family. I mean, their deaths really took a toll on this town. Sergeant Calvatus and some other detectives also went to the funeral, but mostly just to look for anybody who seemed nervous or excited or maybe overly dramatic. But all they found was a large group of people trying desperately to understand how something this horrible could have happened. After the funeral, Calvatus went back to the station. He was on his way to his office when a lieutenant stopped him to tell him that somebody was there to see him. The lieutenant took Calvatus to a very nervous-looking couple who said they had a tip about Nancy's sister, Jean. Jean was a lawyer, and she was heavily involved in political issues in Ireland. At that time, Ireland was in the midst of a violent period known as the Troubles. The Troubles were clashes between Protestants and Catholics over control of Northern Ireland, and there were regular shootings, car bombings, murders, and kidnappings. And Jean was not neutral. She provided legal aid to members of the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, which was the Catholic organization blamed for many acts of violence. The couple also told Sergeant Calvatus that Jean had received a threat that if she returned to Ireland, she would be injured or maybe even killed. But despite that threat, Jean had gone back to Ireland very recently. And when she had arrived home, she showed up with gifts for Nancy and the baby just three days before the murders. The sergeant listened quietly, but inside, he was practically jumping out of his skin. This was the best lead he'd gotten so far. Maybe, he thought, somebody was hired to kill Jean, but killed Nancy and her husband by mistake. Or maybe they killed Nancy on purpose just to hurt Jean. It was not unheard of during the Troubles for innocent family members to be targeted for political revenge. And so, after speaking to this couple, Calvatus got on the phone and called Jean into the station. Later that day, Calvatus sat down across a table in a small interview room with Jean, and he could tell right away she was completely unlike any suspect he'd ever questioned before. Jean was unusually confident for somebody who was about to be questioned by a homicide detective. She sat up perfectly straight and calmly looked Calvatus right in the eyes, without fidgeting or tapping her fingers or shifting around in her seat. 
Calvetus asked Jean some basic questions about her job, and she was quite helpful. But then, the sergeant mentioned the threat that had been made on her life because of her work in Ireland, and also this theory that maybe a hired killer took out Nancy either by mistake or for revenge. At this point, Jean's demeanor totally changed. She went from cool and collected to sharp and visibly angry. She said it was ridiculous to imagine a gunman could confuse Nancy for her. They looked nothing alike. And the idea that someone would kill Nancy to get back at Jean was even more outrageous. Jean insisted that her job in Ireland was mostly human rights work and not worth killing her over, let alone her sister. Jean leaned forward and looked Calvatus dead in the eyes and told him he was really stretching with that theory. Calvatus was genuinely surprised. This was not what he was expecting, and he wasn't sure if Jean's reaction was fueled by righteous indignation at questions she truly considered unfair or anxiety and guilt at the idea that she might have played a role in putting her sister at risk. But the sergeant pressed on, and he asked Jean for the names of every person she had visited the last time she was in Ireland, along with all of her work associates there. Jean turned red and yelled at the sergeant that none of this had anything to do with her sister's murder. She said Calvatus was not getting anything from her, and then she stood up and stormed out of the interview room. Sergeant Calvatus just sat there, both really surprised and really mad. This death threat on Jean was the first real lead they had, and he couldn't fully investigate it without the names from Jean. He had expected her to be grateful and to immediately offer up anything she knew to try to figure out who killed her sister. And so he just couldn't believe Jean was unwilling to help him, unless, of course, she was involved. Without any information from Jean about the death threat, Calvatus was left chasing other possibilities that frankly just seemed increasingly unlikely. Both Richard and Nancy had worked for a coffee company that imported their beans from Colombia, which Calvatus and basically everybody knew, was a major importer of cocaine. He knew that drug cartels sometimes hid cocaine in coffee shipments. In fact, just three months before the murders, federal agents had seized five kilograms of cocaine in a coffee shipment from a different coffee company. So Calvatus started poking around into the coffee company, looking for any ties to cartels. But the owners of the company seemed mostly puzzled by this, and they gave Calvatus permission to inspect their next shipment, like they didn't care at all, look at whatever you want. And so Calvatus did that, flagging the ship that had their coffee on it to U.S. customs officers, who then met the vessel when it came into port. A giant crane lifted the container with their coffee out of the ship and onto the dock, and then customs officer cracked it open. Then they began slicing through random bags of beans to see if their drug-sniffing German shepherds could pick up a scent. But, like Calvatus had feared, they found nothing. The police began to feel like they were just grasping at straws, and so they decided they should just go back to the beginning and kind of start over. So they re-interviewed all the neighbors, and they got one tantalizing tip about a mysterious man walking around the neighborhood the night of the murders, but after looking into it, they discovered it was actually just a bored teenager who lived nearby. After that, they looked into whether Richard and Nancy had maybe taken a loan from mobsters to lease their new place, but when they looked at the couple's tax records, they saw they could easily afford the rent. And so, once again, one after another, all the tips and leads they were finding just went nowhere. Calvatus still had suspicions that Jean's ties to the IRA got her sister killed, but without Jean's cooperation, he struggled to make any headway on that lead. So, by the end of May, Sergeant Calvatus was basically out of ideas as his big case rapidly went cold. Finally, on May 30th, so about a month after the murders, the police chief pulled Calvatus into his office. From the look on Chief's face, Calvatus knew the news was not good, but he could not have guessed what was coming next. The chief told him they were going to dismantle the task force. They had spent a whopping $1 million on this investigation so far and still had not come up with a serious single suspect. Calvatus was shocked. This felt way too early to basically give up, but the chief wasn't done. In addition to dismantling the task force, he wanted Calvatus back on the beat while another investigator stepped in and took a look at this case. The chief followed up and told Calvatus that he was not taking him off the case completely, he just wanted a set of fresh eyes on it. But as Calvatus nodded and turned to walk out of the office, it definitely felt like he had failed and he was being removed. Sergeant Calvatus walked slowly towards his team to break the bad news at the same time feeling totally sick and angry at the thought of patrolling the neighborhood again, with everything in this case still completely up in the air. But a few days later, sure enough, Calvatus was back in his blue uniform, driving a police cruiser around Winnetka. He figured his days as a detective were likely over. 
Six months passed with no progress at all in the Langert case. Sergeant Calvatus focused on working his beat, but at the same time, he just felt so distracted because all he felt was regret that he had not been able to find the killer. But then, on October 4th, Sergeant Calvatus was home sleeping when his wife woke him up telling him that work was calling, just like she had done on the day of the murder. But this time, when he picked the phone up, his lieutenant was yelling excitedly that there had been a break in Nancy and Richard's case, and Calvatus had to get down to the station right now. Calvatus was so excited, he rushed out of bed, he jumped into his car, and he sped to the station. But when he got there, he found the supposed break was just a kid. And not a very tough-looking kid either. It was a skinny high school senior who had arrived at the station with his girlfriend for moral support, asking about the witness protection program. Calvatus had to keep himself from rolling his eyes. He wondered what this kid could possibly know about a brutal double homicide. And at first, when the kid began talking, his story, predictably, sounded unbelievable. The kid said he somehow knew the killer, and the killer had supposedly confessed everything to him in unbelievable detail. But as he began walking Calvatus and the other detectives through what he knew, Calvatus realized this kid was telling the truth. The teenager knew details of the crime that had never been made public, like how many shots were fired and the fact that the marriage contract was on the table. But beyond individual details, the teenager's story explained all the strange contradictions that Calvatus had struggled with since the beginning of the case. Richard was killed quickly and efficiently, but Nancy's murder was messy and slow. The killer had apparently brought a gun along, but someone had grabbed an axe that wasn't entirely clear. And then the killer had used glass cutting tools to get inside, but then needlessly crawled through the tiny hole in the door instead of just reaching through and unlocking it. And so all these things definitely lined up with what Calvatus had suspected. Calvatus had never been able to figure out if the killer was a professional hitman or a sloppy amateur. But now, as the sergeant listened to this kid talk, it seemed like the killer might have been a little bit of both. After speaking to this kid and looking at all the evidence in the case and looking at all their interviews, here is a reconstruction of what police think happened on the night of Saturday, April 7th, 1990, when Nancy and Richard were murdered inside of their home. The killer arrived at Nancy and Richard's townhouse while the couple was out to dinner. The killer had been preparing for this moment for months. They approached the patio door from the path that ran behind the house. They didn't even bother trying the doorknob. Instead, they pulled out a glass cutter to remove a section of the sliding patio doors. And then once the cuts were made, they stuck some very sticky tape to the front of the glass piece and then pulled it out silently, just like they had been practicing. Then, once it was out, instead of reaching through and opening the door, the killer crawled into the house through the hole and then waited. But they had no idea how long it would be before Nancy and Richard came home, and as the minutes turned to hours, the killer began to get restless. And so they just started wandering around the house, sort of aimlessly, rifling through random boxes that were sitting around. And it was there that the killer found Nancy and Richard's marriage contract. They began to read it, but it was mostly legal jargon, so they just placed it on the card table near the box they dug it out of. But the longer the killer waited for Nancy and Richard to come home, the more impatient they got, and the more nervous. And so they ultimately just turned on a light and then sat on a chair in the shadows with their gun on their lap. They had a hood pulled down low, but they thought the light shining from behind them would help hide their face even more. Then finally, sometime after 11 p.m., the killer heard voices and then the key in the door. Nancy and Richard walked inside, but they were so caught up in their conversation, they didn't even notice the killer sitting there. But then the killer spoke and told them to be quiet and closed the door behind them. The killer could instantly see how startled Nancy and Richard were. The killer then raised their gun, and Nancy and Richard's surprise quickly turned to fear. The killer loved it. The killer demanded Nancy hand over her purse. She said she didn't have any money, but the killer demanded the purse again. And so Nancy threw it to the killer, and everything inside of it fell out onto the floor, including the stack of cash totaling $500. Nancy started stammering that she'd forgotten about the money, and Richard urged the killer to just please take the cash and go. She wasn't trying to lie to you. But the killer, who acted totally offended at the idea that they were hiding things from him, was not actually here for their money. They didn't care. The killer, still aiming their gun at Nancy and Richard, reached into their pocket to pull out handcuffs. But as they fished around in their pocket, they began to curse. In their excitement about this night, they'd only brought one pair of handcuffs, not the two they actually needed. But Richard was clearly the bigger threat. He was a tall, athletic guy 
So the killer gave the cuffs to Nancy and told her to handcuff her husband. As Nancy handcuffed Richard's hands behind his back, she began to plead with the killer, Please don't hurt us. I'm pregnant. Something about Nancy's plea hit the killer hard, and they could feel their hands begin to shake. Suddenly there was a noise upstairs, and the killer accidentally pulled the trigger, shooting a bullet into the baseboards. But the killer quickly realized that the noise was just a dog, closed in the upstairs bedroom, barking at something. Still, the killer felt like their plan was now quickly falling apart. Things were already going so wrong. The killer started to lose their nerve, and they thought about sparing Nancy and Richard. So the killer told the couple to go to the basement, and then once they were down there, the killer would lock the door and just leave. And so the killer directed Nancy and Richard to the basement stairs at gunpoint, and no one said a word. But as Nancy and Richard descended the stairs and then reached the bottom of the stairs, Nancy suddenly turned around and looked at the killer. And the killer knew from her surprised look on her face that she had seen the killer's face. The light was better down there, and the hood did not disguise the killer enough. The killer knew Nancy would be able to identify them. And so now the killer had a choice to make. Let them live and face the consequences, or follow through with the plan. But before the killer could decide, Richard made a desperate move. With all his strength, he snapped the cheap handcuffs, jumped at the killer, and smashed his own head against the killer's head. Almost instinctively, the killer just fired the gun, and it hit Richard right in the back of his head. Richard crumpled to the floor. Nancy rushed to his side, screaming, then looked back at the killer, whose gun was still raised. Nancy shouted, not again, no, and covered her face as the killer took a shot at her. The killer turned and ran up the stairs, but as they got to the top, they looked back. Nancy was still alive and moving. The bullet had only hit her in the elbow. The killer knew at this point they had already come this far. They had to go back. So the killer raised their gun again and pulled the trigger one more time. The bullet hit Nancy and lodged in her pregnant stomach. She collapsed to the floor, and the killer turned and ran out of the basement. But after the killer left, Nancy was still alive. Barely. She tried to climb up the stairs, but it was a struggle. The coat she was wearing was quickly filling with blood, weighing her down. And so with an enormous effort, she managed to pull off her jacket, but as she looked up the stairs, she knew it was just too much. She would never get up there. So, Nancy turned and dragged herself over to the basement shelves and grabbed the nearest thing she could reach, the axe. And then with the axe, she banged on the shelf, hoping that the noise would get somebody's attention, but nobody came to the rescue. And so, with her last bit of strength, Nancy dropped the axe, dipped her finger in her own blood, dragged herself over to a moving box on the floor, and drew a heart and the letter U. She looked at Richard, hoping maybe there was a small chance he would live and see her final message, I love you. And then Nancy took her final breath. When the police began investigating this case, they knew that some of the evidence suggested the killer was an amateur, but most of their leads pointed to a professional hitman, which is why Calvatus and his team had been so interested in the mob and in drugs and the IRA. It was a mistake that allowed one person to escape any attention at all, because the killer was right there hanging around the investigation in plain sight the entire time. He was one of the members of the High School Peace Alliance Club who came to the funeral. He was on the track team, too. So he ran past the Langert's house almost every single day. The police had even questioned him, because he was also the teenage boy who had been seen in the neighborhood on the night of the murders, but had quickly been written off. But it turned out that kid, the 16-year-old named David Biro, was the killer. And he also happened to be the son of Nancy's family friends, Nick and Joan Biro, who Nancy had thought might be at her father's birthday party on the night that she was killed. It would turn out 16-year-old David had serious psychological issues, and he had become obsessed with becoming a hitman after seeing the 1980s movie, Bestseller, about a hitman who wanted to turn his story into a book. The idea of killing people excited David, and he had actually already tried to do it at least once before. Prior to the murders, David's parents had him committed to a psychiatric hospital after he tried to poison his own family. But after only two months, his parents had let him come home against the recommendation of his doctors. And once he was home, teenager David Biro chose to live out his hitman fantasy by killing Nancy and Richard. And his reason for targeting Nancy and Richard had nothing to do with their connections to his family. Instead, he chose them as his murder victims because their townhouse was conveniently located and he also found them, quote, annoying. David might have gotten away with these murders, but as the months went by and the police never came for him, he got cocky, and he began to brag to a friend about what he had done. 
He even showed his friend the glass that he'd practiced his glass cutting on, and he also showed him the murder weapon. And David's friend pretty much immediately turned him in, because he was very worried David would kill again. And so, on October 5th, 1990, almost six months to the day after Nancy and Richard were gunned down, David was arrested. It was the day before Nancy's baby would have been due. David was sentenced to life in prison for killing Nancy, Richard, and their unborn child. Nancy's parents would move back into Nancy and Richard's townhouse shortly after the murders as a way to feel closer to Nancy and Richard. In 1982, a very outdoorsy teenage girl and boy who had recently started dating decided to go camping in Maine. Around 1 a.m. on the first night they were there, the girl wakes up because she has to go to the bathroom and she's about to unzip her tent when she stops because she hears some strange noises coming from outside their tent. It wasn't that loud, but it sounded distinctly like something was digging in the ground. But she really had to go, and she figured, you know what, it's probably just some small animal or something. And so she begins to unzip the tent, and there's a little bit of moonlight that night, and there was a clearing outside of their tent. So the moonlight's pouring through, so she has plenty of illumination. And so she looks through this tiny hole, and she can't believe what she sees. It is a grown woman squatting down about two or three feet away from their tent. Her back is to them, so she can't see that she's looking through the tent, and she's feverishly digging into the ground in front of her. The girl literally falls backwards into her tent. She's so startled by what she sees, and she lands on her boyfriend, who immediately gets up, and he's like, what's going on? And she goes, shh, and she points at the little hole where she had unzipped the tent, and she goes, look. The boy is confused, but he can tell his girlfriend is very serious, so he sits up quietly and he looks through the little opening in the door and he sees the digging woman. The boy recoils and looks at his girlfriend and he's like, what is going on out there? He takes a flashlight and she's telling him, don't do it, and he opens up the tent a little bit more and he aims his flashlight directly on this woman and this gets her attention and she stops digging and she stands up slowly and she turns around and faces them and she's got no expression. She's not giving them any indication why she's there. She's not acting aggressive. She's not acting scared. She's just completely neutral. And she stands there staring at them for quite a while before turning around and just walking away from their campsite. And after a little while, when they were pretty certain she was gone, they open their tent all the way. They go outside. They kind of scan around with their flashlights and she's nowhere to be found. And they go to where she was digging. And it's just this weird four inch deep hole in the ground. There's no rhyme or reason to why she was doing that. And so after sitting there wondering what they should do, they settled on, well, tomorrow we'll tell the park rangers that she was here and maybe they'll do something about it. And so feeling pretty confident that this woman's not going to come back, they both go back into the tent, they zip it shut, they get in their sleeping bags, and they're about to go to sleep when they hear someone running towards their campsite. And they know it's this woman. They immediately unzip the tent and they look out. And now the woman's not digging anymore. She's rummaging through some of their stuff that's outside of their tent. And the way she's doing it, they described as monkey-like. She'd pick something up, look at it, and throw it over her head. She'd pick the next thing up, throw it over her head, back and forth, just throwing things behind her. And so the boy gets out and he shines a light on her and goes, you need to leave. And she doesn't react. She just keeps flipping through all their stuff until he gets pretty forceful and says, you need to leave right now. And at that point, she kind of stops and looks at him like, huh, what are you doing here? And then she gets up, turns around, and walks away. Now the couple really doesn't know what to do because she's clearly willing to come back after being confronted. But they stayed outside their tent for about 15 more minutes, shining their light and making lots of noise and treating her like she's an animal. And they're just trying to scare her away from the campsite. And after a little bit of time, they thought, okay, there's no way she comes back now because, you know, we were pretty aggressive with her this time and she seemed to really get it. They both do go back in the tent and as soon as they zip it shut, they hear her come running straight back to the site like she was literally waiting in the wings for when they went back in the tent. And this time she runs back to the hole in the ground and she's just feverishly digging into the ground as fast as she can. And this time they come out of their tent and they're mad and they are screaming at this woman to get the F out of here. What are you doing? And this seems to kind of frighten the woman who gets up and she looks at them like, why are you yelling at me? And she runs away and it looked almost animalistic the way she was running away like she was feral. 
The boy and the girl are totally shaken up at this point. It's about 1.30 in the morning and this woman just keeps coming back to their site and they don't know what to do about it. So they turn on some lanterns and they turn on their flashlights and they decide we're just gonna stay outside until the morning. That way we know she doesn't come back and doesn't steal anything from us. But by about 3.30 in the morning, they've been outside for two hours. They're getting cold, they're super tired. The woman's nowhere to be found. And so they finally say, you wanna go back in and get some sleep? I, I think this time she's really gone. They get back in their sleeping bags and they go to sleep. They don't hear her again. The next morning when they get up and they unzip their tent, they look outside and all of their stuff has been thrown all over the campsite. And the hole in the ground that the woman had dug that was previously about four or six inches deep is now well over a foot deep. And they realize this woman must have been lurking in the shadows in the woods watching them from 1.30 to 3.30 in the morning. That whole time they were out there kind of warding her off. She was just waiting, just watching them the whole time in the shadows. And as soon as they went into their tent, she must have given it a little bit of time, but then she ran right back over and she ransacked their site. But the strangest thing was, after they looked through all of the stuff she had chucked around, nothing was missing. And there was some pretty expensive stuff that was laying out that she could have taken, but didn't. After they picked up their site, they went to the park ranger and they told them about what had happened, but the ranger has no idea what to make of it. He's never heard of such a thing. And so the couple just leaves that day because they're not about to spend another night here. And to this day, they have no idea why this woman was running onto their site and digging into the ground and rummaging through their stuff. It was like she was just a wild animal. Our next story is called Pinch. In the summer of 2013, a young woman named Katie and her father decided to go camping at one of their favorite campgrounds in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Katie loved going camping with her father because he was this totally accomplished outdoorsman and he used to be a wilderness guide for much of his life. And so she just always felt like she was in great hands whenever she was out in the wild with him. And she had kind of become a fairly accomplished outdoors woman herself. When they arrived at the campground, the parking lot was packed with cars. And they're like, shoot, I wish we'd called ahead a couple weeks ago and reserved a site because they're probably not even available now. But they went to the front desk and they were like, you're in luck, we have one available, but it's the one that's way over there. It was this one campsite that was kind of isolated from the rest of the campground. It was far away from the bathhouse, it was far away from where you go swimming, and it was far away from the parking lot. It was just like really inconvenient. And whenever they came camping here, it was like the one site they didn't want to use. But beggars can't be choosers. They were happy to even have a site. And so they drove all the way down, down this little road into this very isolated campsite, kind of in the middle of this forest. Once they got there, they began setting up their respective tents because they were not gonna be staying in the same tent. They each had these very small backpacking tents, which were so small that you could either zip it up all the way and stay warmer and more protected, but you had to sleep in a ball because your legs would not fit otherwise. Or you could unzip the front of your tent and when you lay down, you could extend your legs fully, but your legs are protruding outside of your tent. So you could only do that in warmer weather and if you were comfortable having your legs poking out into the wilderness. After they set up their tents and they get their cooler set up and they have all their stuff kind of the way they want it, they go out hiking for the rest of the day. When they come back, they're totally exhausted, they fall asleep and nothing of note occurs over that first night. The next day they get up, they go back out, they go hiking all day all over again and they come back that night and they are totally exhausted again. And they get into their tents and they go to bed. And this night, something of note would happen. At about 3 a.m., Katie wakes up and she hears footsteps walking towards the campsite from a little ways off. They're in the woods somewhere. And she's thinking, okay, it's gotta be my father because he's diabetic and every night he gets up to go to the bathroom maybe three, four times. And he probably was just walking to the bathhouse and now he's walking back. But she realizes the bathhouse is over here, not over here. So what is he doing walking towards the campsite from this side? The footsteps come out of the tree line, they come into the clearing that is their campsite, and they stop about two, three meters outside of Katie's tent. Now, there were no windows on Katie's backpack tent. There was just little vents at the front and the back that kind of pointed down, and so she couldn't see out anyways, and there was no illumination out, so you can't even pick up a silhouette. It's just total darkness out there. She can't see who's out there. She can only hear them. 
But she's thinking, okay, maybe my dad got lost coming back from the bathhouse because he didn't have a flashlight and he walked too far. That's possible. Or, you know, he could have decided to relieve himself just in the tree line, even though he's not known to do that. He's a guy that goes to the bathhouse. And so she's running through these scenarios that are convincing her that, oh, that's just my dad. But what she really wants to hear is that person walk away from her tent and get into her father's tent, because that will confirm in her mind that that was her father. And so she's sitting here waiting for that confirmation and she hears the footsteps again, but instead of walking around her tent to her father's tent, this person walks right up against her tent very quickly. And they clearly begin leaning over her little tiny tent because she can hear them breathing right above her. And this is when she realizes that's not my dad. And as she's having this terrible revelation that some stranger is outside her tent right now, she has an even worse revelation. It was a warm night that night, so she was sleeping with her tent unzipped and her legs poking out the end. She musters the courage to begin slowly retracting her legs back inside of her tent. But before she's able to do that, this person stands up, turns, and starts walking towards the base of her tent where her legs are. She's completely frozen and terrified about what's about to happen. But this person doesn't stop at her feet. They keep moving and in fact start circling her tent. But because they were making a lot of noise and walking around her, it allowed her to pull her legs back into her tent without, you know, this person hearing her. And so she had the illusion of safety being inside of her tent, but her tent is still unzipped. So she's waiting for this person to come around and crouch down and look inside of her tent because it's open. And so she's just looking down there, hoping that doesn't happen. But unfortunately, right at this moment, the person walked to the base of her tent and came to a stop right outside where the opening to the tent is. And so she's sitting there thinking, please don't come in here, please don't come in here, please don't come in here. And even though her feet are pulled up into her tent, she suddenly feels something pinch her foot and she knows it's a hand, something has grabbed my foot. And she stifles a scream and she starts shaking uncontrollably because her instincts are telling her, don't let this person know you're awake. And luckily, as she's sitting there shaking from fear and trying to be quiet as best as she can, she's holding her mouth, this person stands back up again and goes back to the spot next to her tent and leans over the tent once again, and she can hear them breathing right over her. And so for several minutes, she lay there shaking with this random person who pinched her foot a minute ago, hovering over her tent in the middle of the night. And she has nothing she can do. And she's just quiet. She's hoping it's going to end soon. And eventually this person would turn around and walk over to their cooler and their table and some other things that were out. And she hears some rummaging going on. Some things are being moved around. And then this person just kind of walks off into the distance. But she doesn't know if they're gone. She doesn't know if they're standing in the edge of the tree line waiting for her to come outside. Maybe they laid a trap for her. And so she just lays there, silent, doesn't move, and she's praying to herself, please don't let anything happen to me or my father. And all night she's just laying there. And then eventually she does fall asleep. Probably hours go by, but she does fall asleep because she wakes up again when she hears her father unzipping his tent and she charges out to meet him. And she can tell right away that he's scared. And before she can even say or begin to describe what's happened to her, he says, were you outside your tent last night at about two, three in the morning? Because I heard all sorts of commotion near our cooler. I wasn't sure if it was an animal. I wasn't sure if it was you. And she starts telling him, no, this is what happened to me. And as she's describing what happened to her, he looks behind her at the picnic table, which was next to their cooler and they had their backpacks on it. Basically anything that didn't fit in their tents they kept near this picnic table. And he points at it. And she turns around and any item that was in the cooler or in their backpacks or that was just out has been stacked in a pyramid formation on this table. Clearly, the guy who was here last night did this for some reason they don't understand. And as they go over to look at it to see if anything's been taken, they notice this track of footprints, like these heavy footprints that have been going around and around Katie's tent. So she clearly wasn't imagining it. And so that instant, they packed everything up, got in their car and they left. And to this day, they can barely talk about it with each other because it's all the things that could have happened. The father felt horribly guilty because he clearly heard this person but didn't leave his tent. And his daughter was clearly in danger. And his daughter's thinking, the tent was open. This person was crouched down, reaching into my tent, grabbing my feet. Like that's such a horrifying image. And so this has been completely traumatizing for them and they just don't talk about it anymore. The next and final story of today's episode is called Incomprehensible. 
On the morning of Sunday, June 17th, 2018, 35-year-old Tristan Baudet pulled his phone out of his pocket to check the weather forecast for Orange County, California. Orange County is this beautiful suburb located right between Los Angeles and San Diego. And this beautiful suburb is where Tristan and his wife, 36-year-old Erica Wu, and their two young daughters, aged two and four, called home. And on this day, which was Father's Day, Tristan had gotten up early to check the weather to make sure it was going to be clear that day because he really wanted to take his family out for a fun beach day to celebrate his holiday. And he was in luck because when his app loaded, it showed that Orange County was going to be beautiful and clear all day. Although, even if the weather had come back as rainy and horrible and cold, Tristan was the kind of person who still would have wanted to go to the beach. Because for Tristan, anything outdoors was really awesome. That was his happy place, being out in nature. Whether it was going to the beach or going hiking or camping or just throwing a frisbee around outside, he didn't care. If he was outside, he was good with it. And even though his daughters were still very young, they both already had totally fallen in love with nature just like their dad had, which made Tristan just so happy. Because now, he had these two little sidekicks that would go with him on all of his outdoor adventures. As for Tristan's wife, Erica, she did love the outdoors, but maybe not as much as Tristan did. But that was okay with Tristan, because all he would do is make little adjustments to his adventures to make it more bearable for Erica. Like, whenever they went camping, Tristan would totally rough it in a tent right on the ground, but he would bring along a big, full-size blow-up mattress for his wife. And this was something that Erica just adored about Tristan. Not that he literally waited on her hand and foot, but rather that Tristan just kind of went with the flow. If his wife wanted a blow-up mattress, that was fine. You know, it didn't matter to him. That was just who he was. He just, he didn't judge people. He just, he was at peace with the world. And in fact, it was that character trait that had originally attracted Erica to Tristan. Erica had met Tristan back in high school when some mutual friends had set them up. Tristan didn't have a date to a dance at a school, and so the friends were kind of like, Erica, go with him! And so Erica would agree to go, and on the night, she actually met Tristan for the first time. She's laying eyes on him for the first time. He was a sight to behold. The summer prior, he had sprouted up like four inches or so, so he's super tall, but his body hadn't quite filled out yet, so he's super lanky looking, and he was totally overdressed for this dance. He had on this full tuxedo, and he was not remotely self-conscious. He was only psyched to have a date to this dance. And during this dance, Tristan would just totally rock that tuxedo in all of his gangly glory, as if this tuxedo was made for him. And he would really try hard to make sure that Erica had a good time with him, and she totally did. And so after this dance was over, the pair was inseparable. Erica would go on to study at Stanford and would become an OBGYN doctor. As for Tristan, he would become this wildly successful, widely published scientist with a patent related to vaccine delivery. However, in typical Tristan fashion, he didn't care at all about his resume. It didn't matter that it was completely stacked. I mean, on paper, this guy was just unbelievable. But Tristan never changed his personality. He never changed anything about himself. In fact, his scientist colleagues, who adored him, they used to think it was hysterical that this brilliant chemist, who was on the cutting edge of various cancer treatments and all this crazy research, that guy was actually this big, mellow-type person who wandered around the lab and started most of his sentences with, Dude! By early afternoon on that Father's Day in 2018, Erica and Tristan and their two little girls had made their way to a local beach, and Erica had found herself sitting in a beach chair reading a book, and Tristan and the girls had set up a sunshade right down where the water broke, and they were digging in the sand. And so over the course of that afternoon, Erica, she's reading her book, and periodically she would look up, and she would see Tristan and the girls digging in the sand or making sandcastles. And then at some point, Tristan and the girls, they would get up and abandon their dig site, and they would run into the water, and then they would run back to shore right as the waves were breaking, trying to kind of escape the waves. And the two little girls thought this was so much fun, and they were laughing hysterically and screeching with excitement as the waves crashed at their ankles. These are tiny little waves. And at some point, Erica, she's looking up watching this and she sees her two little girls having a blast and she sees her husband flash her this big grin because he knows this is totally funny. And at that moment, Erica suddenly felt herself feel something that she didn't always feel these days. And that was just contentedness, happiness. 
Tristan, because he was this totally laid back guy, he was able to just kind of enjoy life as it came to him. But Erica, she couldn't do that. She was a constant worrier. And that was largely because when she was just eight years old, she lost her father. And it was this totally traumatic experience that really upset her childhood. It was just devastating for the family. And so ever since then, she had developed this very real paranoia that no matter how good her life was, that at any second it was going to be ruined by something horrible happening to her. But as she sat in this chair, watching her husband smiling at her and seeing her kids playing with him, it was just this perfect moment. And so Erica would put the book down and she would get up and run into the surf to be with her family. Little did she know, something horrible was about to happen. Four days later, on June 21st, Erica was home studying for this big medical exam she was scheduled to take the next day. But at the house with her was her husband and her two little girls. And so the house was totally chaotic and loud. And it was obvious to Tristan as he looked over at his wife that she was really struggling to focus. And Tristan also knew that they were a week away from moving. They were moving to San Francisco. They had just put a deposit down on a house. They had some family up there. So it was a smart move to make. But they still had a lot to do for this move. And so Tristan's looking at his wife knowing that, you know, the stress levels have got to be through the roof for her. And so Tristan decided he would just take the girls and head out for the weekend to make sure Erica had the time and space she needed to prepare for this test and also just maybe to be alone and have some peace and quiet. And so Tristan made a couple of phone calls and then after he was done, he talked to Erica and he told her that he had just made reservations at this campsite up in Malibu, California. Malibu is another beautiful Southern California town located about an hour and a half north of Orange County. It's where a lot of celebrities live. It's a very rich part of California. And he tells Erica that he had made reservations in this campground that's out there and that he had called his brother-in-law named Scott, who had two young kids himself, ages three and five, and they were all going to go there together and spend the weekend at this campsite. Now, Erica was very thankful for her husband for being willing to do this because she did need the time and space to study. But she immediately was just concerned about it because, you know, Tristan, he would take the girls and go out on all sorts of adventures all the time, but he had never gone camping overnight without her there. And so her reaction was to worry about it. But Tristan, who knew his wife very well, told her, don't worry, I will take great care of the kids. It's a place that's totally public. It's an amazing campground. There's loads of people around. It's totally safe. And so eventually Erica was convinced. And so Tristan began packing the car with all the camping supplies and the kids' toys and the kids' bikes. And as he's doing that, and the girls are really excited about this camping trip, Erica still found herself thinking, you know, I hope they cancel this trip because she just couldn't help feeling like something bad was about to happen to them. But Tristan did not cancel the trip. And after the car was all packed and the girls had been tucked into their car seats in the back seat, Tristan kissed Erica goodbye and said he would see her in a couple of days and good luck on your test tomorrow. And with that, Tristan hopped into the car, he backed out of the driveway, and Erica watched as he pulled up the road and headed north towards Malibu. After studying well into the night, Erica finally went to sleep, and then the next morning, she got up early because she was nervous about the test, she was anxious about her husband and her kids, and so she's up early and she's getting ready, and as she's getting ready, she hears a loud knock on the front door. She looks at her clock and she sees it's 6.45 in the morning and there was no reason for anybody to be knocking on her door that early in the morning, maybe unless it was Tristan, but he wouldn't be knocking on the door, he'd just be coming inside. And so apprehensively, she walked out of her room and went to the front of the house and then she opened the front door. And as soon as she saw who was standing there, she knew something was wrong. Erica would later reflect on this moment when she opened the door. And even though it didn't make sense and it was irrational, she would sometimes think to herself, what if I had just never opened the door? Would this nightmare have really happened? But Erica did open the door and standing out there was her sister-in-law, Priscilla, who was there unannounced. She lived an hour and a half away and she looked very frazzled and upset. And she would give Erica absolutely heartbreaking news. News that was so earth shattering that Erica literally couldn't comprehend it. Like this cannot be true. There literally has to be a mistake, but there was no mistake. Erica would not take her medical exam that day. Instead, she would hop into the car with Priscilla and they would drive to Malibu. The day before, Tristan and his two little girls, after driving for about an hour and a half, arrived in Malibu at the entrance to the Malibu Creek State Park. 
Now, when most people think of Malibu, they just think of the beautiful properties lining the beach. They think of celebrities and rich people and exclusivity. And that's all true, but what a lot of people don't know about Malibu is that just outside of the kind of main Malibu area is this totally wild area, this very rugged terrain, all these canyons, all these heavily forested areas. It all kind of butts up against the outside of Malibu. And in this totally rugged area is where the Malibu Creek State Park is. So Tristan and Scott, they arrive at the gates of this park that leads into this wilderness, and they check in with the park rangers up front, and they are directed to their respective campsites that they had reserved. They had reserved two sites right next to each other. And all a campsite is, usually, is just a square little plot of land with nothing in it, and it's a place where you put your tent on, and sometimes there's a fire pit inside of it. It's really sparse. And so Tristan and Scott, they thank the park ranger, they drive all the way across the campgrounds, they get to their designated spots, and right away Tristan's like, these are just not very good campsites. They were located right near the porta potties, so it kind of smelled bad, and there was lots of foot traffic right in front of their sites, and their site was kind of at a tilt too, so just overall it was not ideal. And so Tristan said this to Scott, and Scott decided he would just go talk to the park rangers again and see if they could change their campsites. And so he went to the front, talks to the park ranger, and they say, no problem, there's actually two open campsites on the other side of the park, we'll just swap your reservation. And so Tristan and Scott and the kids, they make their way to these other two campsites, and these are perfect. They're kind of tucked up at the base of this huge canyon. There are no porta potties nearby, so no foot traffic, it's very private, and the land was totally flat. And so the men are totally happy with this and they start getting their stuff out of their vehicles and setting up their tents and the kids are running around playing and riding their little bikes around. And then after their campsites were mostly set up, Scott and Tristan made a fire in the fire pit that was located roughly between where the two tents had been set up. And so Scott was sleeping with his two sons in his tent and Tristan would be sleeping with his two girls in his tent. And so they get this big fire going and then all the kids and the adults, they sit around the fire and they start roasting hot dogs and making s'mores, which is marshmallow, chocolate and graham cracker. And the dads are telling funny jokes and spooky stories too. And before long, the kids are just totally exhausted. And so Scott and Tristan both take their kids and put them to bed inside of their tents. And then after the kids are tucked in, the two men come back to the fire and Tristan, who had packed pre-made cocktails, he pulls those out and he shares one with Scott. And then the two men just enjoyed each other's company, you know, sat around the campfire, chatted for a while. It was mostly Tristan talking about his upcoming move to San Francisco, but Scott was happy to just listen. And then at some point, the two men were just totally exhausted and they decided it was time for them to go to bed. And so they put out the fire. Scott would hug Tristan and tell him that he loved him. And then the two men would leave the campfire and go to their respective tents. As Scott climbed into his tent with his two sons, he turned and looked out the open flap of his tent across the fire pit towards Tristan's tent. And he saw Tristan climb into the tent with his girls. And so after he sees Tristan get into his tent, Scott zips up his own tent and he lies down. And within 10 or 15 minutes, Scott is fast asleep. Just before sunrise the next day, so around 4.45 a.m., Scott suddenly woke up. He thought he heard a loud sound, but he couldn't place the sound. And so he's just laying there. It's still dark outside. And as he's kind of getting his bearings, he realizes one of Tristan's daughters is crying in her tent. Now, this was not cause for alarm necessarily, because Scott just thought, you know, whatever she was upset about, Tristan would certainly calm her down any minute and she'd be okay. But as Scott was laying there with his two sons sleeping right next to him, Tristan's daughter just continued to cry. Now, Tristan was a famously heavy sleeper, and so Scott was thinking, okay, you know, he just must not be awake, and so that's why he's not able to comfort his daughter. And so Scott would carefully get up, he'd unzip his tent, you know, he'd be careful not to step on his sons. He went outside, and outside it's cold, it's dark, he cannot see inside of Tristan's tent, there's no windows on it. And so he just walks over, and by the time he gets to the tent, he can hear clear as day, Tristan's daughter is still crying. And so Scott kind of loudly, but still whispering, says, Hey, Tristan, Tristan, wake up! But Tristan doesn't wake up. 
And so with Tristan's daughter still crying right on the other side of the nylon of this tent, Scott decides to just open the tent up and look inside. And so he walks around to the front of the tent, he unzips the tent, and he looks inside. Now, it's too dark, he can't really tell what he's looking at, but even with the minimal light, he could tell that Tristan was clearly still sleeping right in the middle of the tent, and positioned on either side of him was his two-year-old daughter and his four-year-old daughter. And from the looks of it, the two-year-old was crying, and the four-year-old, who was also whimpering, was doing her best to comfort the two-year-old. And so Scott's looking in, wondering what's going on, when the two little girls, they turn and look up at Scott, and when they see him, they just start saying, wet, wet, wet. Now, Scott doesn't know what they're talking about. He's starting to get a little bit flustered because he thinks something's wrong. And so he reaches in and just starts shaking Tristan, saying, hey, wake up. But as soon as he did that, he could tell Tristan's not sleeping. Tristan is dead. And his two little girls are sitting in a pool of his blood. Right before Scott had woken up, someone who was standing near the campsite had fired a gun several times, and one of their bullets went into Tristan's tent and struck him right in the head as he slept next to his daughters. Roughly two hours after Tristan was killed, Priscilla showed up on Tristan's doorstep to tell his wife, Erica, what happened, that her little girls were about to grow up without a father just like she did. This news absolutely destroyed Erica. A 42-year-old man named Anthony Rauda would be arrested and charged with Tristan's murder. Rauda had a long criminal history, and at the time of Tristan's murder, he was living illegally in this park up in the canyon nearby, and when he was arrested, he was in possession of a gun that was ballistically linked to the bullet that killed Tristan. His trial is still ongoing because Rauda keeps firing his defense attorneys, which delays the trial. While Rauda has said he's innocent, he didn't do this, his behavior in court so far has not made him look any more innocent. He has been so violent and erratic during the initial court proceedings that when he goes into court, they have to strap his wrists and his legs into a chair and put what's called a spit hood over his head, which prevents him from spitting on people and biting people. Assuming he was the shooter, that he was responsible for shooting Tristan, which most people believe he was, and there really is an enormous amount of evidence that supports this, but again, his trial is still ongoing. But if we assume he was the shooter, the theory is it was completely random. He did not know Tristan. He basically just fired his gun either intentionally into the tent or recklessly, and he just happened to fire into the tent. But either way, one of his bullets struck Tristan in the head and killed him, meaning Tristan was literally just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if this case wasn't heartbreaking enough, one more distressing detail is that this shooting was not the first shooting in or around this campground. In the year leading up to Tristan's death, there were an astounding six other shootings, two of which happened literally in the campground right where Tristan was killed. Now, none of these other shootings were fatal, but in all six cases, the shooter or shooters were never caught, and the Malibu police just kind of didn't investigate. It wasn't until Tristan got shot and killed in this campground that the stories of all these other shootings that never got solved came out, and people are looking on a map saying, wait a minute, there's all these shootings unsolved with a rogue shooter or shooters out and about right here, right over this campground, and we haven't shut down the campground, and we haven't told the public that there's potentially a uncaught shooter roaming around this campground? Why is that? In the meantime, Erica has filed a $90 million lawsuit against several agencies saying that her husband had no idea there was this threat of an uncaught shooter at that campground and had authorities put any sort of warning up, Tristan never would have taken his kids inside of that park and he would be alive today. Her lawsuit is still ongoing. On Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, Anthony Rauda was sentenced to life in prison for second-degree murder of Tristan Baudet and three counts of attempted murder, including two involving Tristan's daughters. 
Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please release a horde of angry emus into the Amazon Music Follow Button's house while they're at work. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, 